ערב טוב, גם בערב גשום כזה. Tonight is the uh, opening night of part of an ongoing George Mosser lecture series. Uh, I won't say too much uh, about George. I think the amount of people who knew George Mosser in this audience, uh, there are some. Uh, I think almost everyone who knew him loved him and admired him and found him to be an unbelievably nurturing teacher who was more than a teacher, but a friend and an inspiration, and who also left us with this fantastic program. We have here some of the students on the exchange program. Some of them are studying with me, and I absolutely coerced them to come here tonight, but that's uh, part of the deal. And uh, students who go to Madison, Wisconsin, plus this lecture series, uh, it's a series which uh, always is published as book in book form uh, after the lectures, and we allow the lecturers more scope in the book than we do in the lectures, uh, but that is the nature uh, of lecture giving. So uh, I am indeed honored, and more than that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Martin Jay who also is both a friend and a remarkably distinguished scholar. I want to start with a few personal words of introduction because it is very rare in an often stuffy academic world that one finds so distinguished a person with such warmth, helpfulness, and lack of pretension. When I first arrived in Berkeley in 1990, uh, and already looked at Martin Jay as a personage of unreachable transcendence. I asked him, as he was editor of the series Weimar Now, if he would consider publishing a book I'd written on the Nietzsche legacy. And without blinking an eye and with tremendous encouragement, immediately uh, agreed. That was an extremely touching moment in my life, and I was even more honored when the book came out and I was sandwiched in between the German philosopher Ernst Bloch and the American intellectual historian Martin Jay. I was number two in the series, Bloch one, and Martin Jay at number three. Um, he is unfailingly positive and helpful. He has produced remarkable students in America, teaching in places like Columbia and Harvard. And I must say something about Hebrew University professors. I don't know anybody who has Sha'ot Kabbalah more than one hour. I checked his CV and he has four hours Sha'ot Kabbalah. So maybe we have something uh, to learn from that. If anyone ever sends an email to him, the reply comes back almost before you've sent the email out. And this is true when I invited Marty, as I call him, uh, to give this series of lectures. I can't remember exactly when it was, but I was completely surprised by the rapidity of his agreement, and we are delighted to have him here. I'm not going to read all the honors and prizes that he has received, and I'm quickly going to read to you some, not all of the books uh, he has published, and then I'll just comment briefly on one or two. Try and swallow this. His first book, The Dialectical Imagination, A History of the Frankfurt School and the Institute of Social Research, has been published in Japanese, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Dutch, Turkish, Chinese, Indonesian, Greek, Portuguese, and one of them I didn't understand, that was the Serbo-Croatian uh, edition. Uh, what is missing from this remarkable amount of translations is one language. There's no Hebrew edition, and I think that somebody should take care, uh, take care of that. Because we all speak Serbo-Croatian. <laughs> <laughs> His uh, uh, other books, Marxism and Totality, The Adventures of a Concept from Lukas to Habermas, Adorno, 
permanent exiles, fin de siècle socialism, force fields, downcast eyes, the denigration of vision in 20th century French thought, cultural semantics, refractions of violence, more articles than I've written, songs of experience, modern European, American and European variations on a universal theme, and a work which seems to me entirely relevant both to what happened in the United States two, two or three days ago and what is going to happen here in a month or two, a book entitled The Virtues of Mendacity on Lying in Politics. Um, just let me say uh, uh, one thing here that I think that the pioneering work that was translated into 20 languages, the dialectical imagination, more than anything else brought to excited attention, mainly in the US but also elsewhere, the whole uh, field of uh, Frank the Frankfurter School and critical theory. Um, and I would like to say too that some, you, sometimes you have books that you really value and which you mark page by page. Today I took out my copy of Marxism and Totality and to my amazement I could hardly read it given the number of underlinings, yellow markings, wow, an occasional nonsense I would say, but usually wow, uh, and a delight uh, uh, reading it. So, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Martin Jay, who is going to talk about something which doesn't, I hope, happen to us, the eclipse of reason. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve, for that uh, over-the-top, uh, generous uh, introduction. Um, thanks to John, to Asya, to everybody who made it possible for me to come back to Jerusalem. Uh, I accepted the invitation very quickly because uh, this is a town that's very hard not to want to come back to, and so uh, it's really a great thrill to be here. Um, let me begin rather self-indulgently by um, uh, reading from a letter that I got uh, in uh, June of 1973. Uh, June 4th, 1973, it's on uh, the Hebrew University stationery, the Institute of Contemporary Jewry, and it begins, uh, Dear Martin, I wonder if you could do me a favor. I was dining with Sholem the other day, and he very much wanted to see a copy of your book. As we were dining under Clay's Angelus Novus, which Benjamin had bequeathed Sholem, but which Adorno had possessed until his death, I think he deserved the book. Could you have him sent a copy? Anyhow, as you will turn up here one of these days, it would be a good introduction. By the way, Sir Isaiah Berlin was there too, and he knew Adorno, but his opinion of him as a philosopher seems very low. However, he found him amusing. And then the letter goes on for a bit and finishes, please excuse my request, but you have been co-opted at any rate into the Weimar Jewish ambience. The uh, writer of the letter, uh, have a good summer, uh, was uh, George Mosse. Uh, and so it's, uh, I sent the, the book to, uh, to Sholem, but this is really an opportunity to thank George, as it were, uh, for welcoming me into the ambiance of Weimar Jewry. And uh, uh, you know, you give a lot of these lectures, uh, and they're named after people you've never heard of, uh, and you know, you're thankful for their beneficence. But in this case, George was a personal friend, and uh, you can hear in a letter like that, uh, 40 years after it's written almost, the uh, warmth uh, and uh, engagement uh, with uh, young people, I was only in my 20s then, that uh, typified his extraordinary career, and Steve, of course, among others, benefited from that. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming out on a rainy night. Uh, uh, it's uh, three lectures in one week. I can't imagine anybody is going to sit through all three, but I hope each one will be, uh, you know, in other words, uh, let's say self-sufficient enough to justify coming at least to uh, tonight's, and perhaps uh, your interest will be piqued for the subsequent two. The lecture, uh, in a way, is the answer to a question that I put to Friedrich Pollock, one of the members of the Frankfurt School, uh, when I was doing work on them back in the 1960s. I had read Eclipse of Reason by Horkheimer, and I said, look, I just don't understand what you guys meant by reason. Uh, I, I didn't quite, I, I thought I understood the, uh, the basic, uh, let's say, inclination, but I, I didn't really understand the philosophical justification. And Pollock responded, look, that we've written books on this. I mean, have you? Know? And I've been asking that question ever since. So <clears throat> these three lectures really are uh, 
uh, dedicated to trying to make sense of what the Frankfurt School understood by reason, and uh, most specifically what Jürgen Habermas, the greatest member of the second generation of the Frankfurt School, uh, meant when he uh, reversed the paradigm uh, of reason. The first lecture will deal with uh, the early Frankfurt School, Horkheimer basically, uh, Marcuse and Adorno. The second will look at Habermas's uh, revision of their ideas about reason. The third will look at some of the critiques that were leveled at Habermas, and I'll try to make some general observations about what I think survives those critiques. All right, let me begin. In 1941, arguably one of the bleakest years in all of modern history, the Frankfurt School reluctantly acknowledged for the very first time the crisis of the emphatic concept of reason that had in fact been a mainstay of its work for much of the previous decade. The disillusionment was abrupt. Although in his earliest days, Max Horkheimer had, in good historical materialist fashion, denounced the dualism and idealism he saw in Cartesian rationalist metaphysics, he had come staunchly to defend a dialectical notion of reason against what he saw as the irrationalist alternatives which he identified with the threat of fascism. While acknowledging <clears throat> that rationality in its liberal uh, bourgeois form was tied to egoistic self-preservation rather than the general good, he'd resisted the conclusion that reason to core, reason uh, in general, inevitably led in that direction. And as a result, one commentator, in fact, has identified, this is his term, a rationalist turn in critical theory around, oh, 1937, in which concrete political hopes were now replaced uh, by more philosophical concerns. In an essay of that year, an essay called The Latest Attack on Metaphysics, Adorno would in fact argue, quote, that rationalism uses existing objects as well as the active inner strivings and ideas of man to construct standards for the future. In this regard, it is not so closely associated with the present order as is empiricism. So in other words, reason somehow has a critical force. In the same year, Herbert Marcuse, would add in the pages of the Zeitschrift für Sozialforschung, the Institute's journal, quote, reason is the fundamental category of philosophical thought, the only one by means of which it has bound itself to human destiny. Philosophy wanted to discover the ultimate and most general grounds of being. Under the name of reason, it conceived the idea of authentic being, you hear a bit of Heidegger in this, uh, in which all significant antitheses of subject and object, essence and appearance, thought and being were reconciled. So reason, we might say, is the organ of reconciling, overcoming, sublating uh, contradictions, oppositions, uh, and dualisms. Four years later, Marcuse's spirit of defense of Hegel against his alleged support for authoritarianism, a book significantly called Reason and Revolution, could even more vigorously celebrate the critical energy of universal reason. In its dialectical guise, which emphasized the power of negation reason had resisted the affirmative implications of positivism in all of its forms. Going beyond the limits of the understanding, Verstand, uh, the limits that Kant had posited for cognition, reason, Vernunft, was a synthetic faculty, a faculty able to incorporate even the moral norms that Kant had relegated to practical reason alone. According to Marcuse, Hegel's idea of reason with which he himself clearly identified, quote, has retained, though in an idealistic form, the material strivings for a free and rational order of life. The core of Hegel's philosophy is a structure, the concepts of which freedom, subject, mind, notion, are derived from the idea of reason." End quote. Capitalist rationalization, tied, of course, to commodity fetishism, the domination of exchange value, and what Georg Lukács had damned as reification, Capitalist rationalization was a pathological distortion of this very ideal. As Marx had famously said in 1843, quote, reason has always existed, but not always in rational form. Now, despite Subro's attentions between Marcuse and some of his colleagues at the time, and there were uh, difficulties that later surfaced, the book was in fact proudly dedicated to Max Horkheimer and the Institute of Social Research, whose theoretical stance Marcuse thought he shared. But in a new essay that appeared in 1941, an essay by Max Horkheimer, an essay called Reason and Self-Preservation, an essay which first appeared in a private volume to mourn the recently perished Walter Benjamin, a very different note 
was struck. When it appeared in the final issue of the Institute's journal, which coincided with Horkheimer's move from New York to California and the growing importance of his partnership with Theodor Adorno, the essay was retitled. Uh, and the essay's new title, uh, very apocalyptic, uh, I think tells uh, where Horkheimer was uh, at this fateful moment, 1941. It was now called The End of Reason. The fundamental concepts of civilization, he writes, are in a process of rapid decay. The decisive concept among them was that of reason, and philosophy knew no higher principle." End quote. The decay of reason, Horkheimer then suggested, was due not only to the failure to realize itself in the world, the failure, let's say, of the Marxist project, but also to a fatal characteristic of the concept itself. Ironically, the inherent connection between reason and critique could ultimately be carried to the point that reason might undermine its own legitimacy. Rationalism, he writes, rationalism itself had established the criteria of rigidity, clarity, and distinctness as the criteria of rational cognition. Skeptical and empirical doctrines opposed rationalism with these self-same standards. Skepticism purged the idea of reason of so much of its content that scarcely anything is left of it. Reason in destroying conceptual fetishes ultimately destroyed itself. None of the categories of rationalism has survived, none. Now, there is to be sure a withered residue of reason still left in human behavior, Horkheimer conceded, but only in its instrumental guise. Its features, he writes, can be summarized as the optimum adaptation of means to ends, thinking as an energy-saving operation. It is a pragmatic instrument an instrument oriented to expediency, cold, and sober." End quote. Now, was this an aberration? Uh, or was it a working out of a sinister potential that always lurked in reason from the very beginning? Marcuse had been inclined to blame it on the increased power of technological rationality in the modern world. But Horkheimer, at his most pessimistic, Horkheimer asserted, quote, that as close as the bond between reason and efficiency is here revealed to be, in reality, so has it always been." End quote. To the extent that reason claimed universal ahistorical validity, it was based, moreover, on a lie, because all previous societies were divided, divided along class lines. As the universality of reason had become more frankly formalistic, empty in a way of content, it has resigned itself to the separation of thought and object, the ideal of universality betrayed by the reality of class division. The increasing influence of nominalism, which meant the loss of any hope for a substantive concept of reason as inhering in the actual world, also ratified the separation of facts from values and the hegemony of calculation. So in other words, he's abandoning the old uh, Leibnizian notion of the principle of sufficient reason, that the world has inherent in it uh, a kind of deep and uh, eternal rationality. He writes, the triumph of nominalism goes hand in hand with the triumph of formalism. In limiting itself to seeing objects as a strange multiplicity, as a chaos, reason becomes a kind of adding machine that manipulates analytical judgments. So the world is a chaos, reason imposes itself on it, calculating uh, in a way, uh, formally uh, making what is qualitatively distinct, fungible. Along with this decline of reason into the instrumentality that was always lurking under the surface of the substantive concept, when the concomitant erosion of the individual subject who was supposed to be its bearer. Although in the past, the dialectic of self-preservation and self-sacrifice meant that there was some rough balance between individual and community, now the former, the subject, the individual, was in total disarray. He writes, the destruction of rationalistic dogmatism through the self-critique of reason carried out by the ever renewed nominalistic tendencies in philosophy has now been ratified by historical reality. The substance of individuality itself, to which the idea of autonomy was bound, did not survive the process of industrialization. Reason has degenerated because it was the ideological projection of a false universality, which now shows the autonomy of the subject to have been an illusion. The collapse of reason, and the collapse of individuality are one and the same. This is all from uh, the Eclipse of Reason. The result is the political horror that was now sweeping over Europe, which must be understood as more than an expression of atavistic irrationalism. Quote, the new order of fascism 
is reason revealing itself as unreason, end quote. Holding on to a faint hope that fascism might not have the last word, Horkheimer concluded his Jeremiah with a modified evocation of Rosa Luxemburg's famous choice. Uh, you may remember it from her World War I Junius pamphlet. The progress of reason that leads to its self-destruction has come to an end. There is nothing left but barbarism or freedom. She had said barbarism or socialism, socialism or barbarism. Now, throughout the 40s, Horkheimer still did desperately <coughs> attempt to salvage something from the wreckage of reason. But even the end of the war, even the defeat of fascism did not lessen his dire conclusion, uh, and this is from an essay in 1946, that reason itself today seems to suffer from a kind of disease. And it's an interesting metaphor. I'll get back to it in a bit. The interesting uh, metaphor of disease, the cure of which is uncertain. Only digging deep into its past might provide some potential relief. Reason, he writes, must reconstruct the history of its vicissitudes. Try, as it were, to recollect its origins and understand its own inherent self-destructive trends and mechanisms. Reason's ability to render an account of its transformation from the power by which all things are perceived to a mere instrumentality of self-preservation is a condition of its recovery." End quote. Only by facing the sources of what he called the self-liquidation of reason can the process of enlightenment, which despite its paradoxical implications needs to be encouraged, only then can that process survive. He writes, the hope of reason lies in the emancipation from its own fear of despair. Now, struggling against that fear, while at the same time not flinching from the despair, uh, were the motivations behind Horkheimer's subsequent works, Eclipse of Reason, I mentioned it already, 1947, and The Dialect of Enlightenment, uh, which he wrote jointly with Adorno, came out also in that same year. Together, those two works, written after the war, uh, at least published after the war, a lot of it written during and before even, together they represent the summa of the Frankfurt School's thesis of the self-liquidation of reason. Now, this is not the place to hazard yet another detailed summary of their complicated arguments, which will be familiar to any student of the history of critical theory. But let me make a few remarks about their general implications for the larger uh, narrative that I'm trying to uh, present you. The subtle shift from a title proclaiming reason had ended to one suggesting it was merely in eclipse signaled the stubborn refusal of the Frankfurt School's first generation to believe that all was lost. They did not accept that it was complete despair. Eclipse of reason, while no longer strongly defending an explicitly Hegelian notion of totalizing reason, nonetheless was careful to distance itself from the alternative presented by Max Weber's frank dismissal of any substantive goal-setting rationality that went beyond mere instrumental or functionalist alternatives. Weber, Horkheimer charged, quote, adhered so definitively to the subjectivistic trend that he did not conceive of any rationality, not even a substantial one, by which man can discriminate one end from another. If our drives, intentions, and finally our ultimate decisions must a priori be irrational, substantial reason becomes an agency merely of correlation and is therefore essentially functional. So he's pushing back against Weber's uh, abandonment of the goal of substantive rationality. Against the functionalist and subjectivist reduction of reason's instrumentality, Horkheimer recalled what he termed an objective alternative, which meant, quote, reason as a force not only in the individual mind, but also in the objective world, in relations among human beings and between social classes and social institutions and in nature and in its manifestations, end quote. Now, this notion of objective reason, this is the one that baffled me when I was discussing it with Fred Pollack, at first appeared in ancient Greek philosophy and was revived in post-Kantian German idealism. The emphatic concept of reason, however, had been undermined not only by subjectification and functionalization, but also by formalization. Quote, in the end, no particular reality can seem reasonable per se. All the basic concepts, emptied of their content, have come to be only formal shells. As reason is subjectivized, it also becomes formalized, end quote. And we'll see, just to anticipate uh, in the next lecture, that Habermas gives a more positive reading of the formalization of reason, proceduralization of reason, in his own communicative rational terms, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Well, how do we get access to objective reason, an inherent reason that is not projected onto the world by a subject bent on self-preservation or control of nature. How can we restore what Socrates called a reflection of the true nature of being, true nature of things? 
How do we restore meaning to a world in which ends, goals, are arbitrary, are irrational, and only means considered rational? Now, in Eclipse of Reason, although Horkheimer clearly was yearning to give an answer, he could only come up with a very weak and rather formulaic reply. He says, quote, this structure is accessible to him who takes upon himself the effort of dialectical thinking, or identically, who is capable of eros. Very interesting uh, reference to eros. Uh, we'll see Marcuse picks it up. Not clear what he means by it. On the other hand, the term objective reason may also designate this very effort, an ability to reflect such an objective order. Not much, really, to chew on in that kind of response. Marcuse, in Reason and Revolution, could still defiantly identify reason in basically a left Hegelian manner with the radical negation of the status quo, implying that there was a, a force in history, a negation that was, in fact, more than just a wish, more than just an ought, that might become its very carrier. Horkheimer now only mentioned negation rather sparingly, although conceding that it would be wrong to equate truth goodness and reason with reality as it was now experienced. This is what the positivists had done. This is what he disliked. It was moreover impossible, he stressed, to restore an outmoded notion of metaphysical reason as advocated during this very period by contemporary neo-Thomists. And Eclipse of Reason is directed against neo-Thomism, Aristotelianism, as an attempt to go back to some version uh, now discredited of objective uh, reason. He writes, for such undisturbed confidence in the realism of the rational scholastic apparatus was shattered by the Enlightenment. So you can't go back, and later philosophers like Alastair McIntyre, for example, would be uh, subject to the, subjected to the same dismissal. But the Enlightenment's own alternative was, of course, deeply problematic itself, including the reduction of reason to mere reasonableness, which implied adjustment and, quote, conformity with reality as it is. As he'd argued in those earlier essays I mentioned before, the shattering that climaxed in the Enlightenment was an outcome of the self-liquidation of reason, not something brought to it from the outside. He writes, if one were to speak of a disease affecting reason, once again, that metaphor of a disease, this disease should be understood not as having stricken reason at some historical moment, but as being inseparable from the nature of reason in civilization as we know it. The disease of reason, the disease of reason is that reason was born from man's urge to dominate nature, a theme that was, of course, even more extensively developed in dialectic enlightenment. It was as if the mortal illness of reason was already latent in its genes. Born of the self-sacrificial cunning needed to survive in a hostile environment, it never lost its original taint, what one observer was to call its mark of Cain. Indeed, Horkheimer goes on, the transition from objective to subjective reason was not an accident. And the process of development of ideas cannot arbitrarily at any moment, any given moment, be reversed. If subjective reason in the form of enlightenment has dissolved the philosophical basis of beliefs that have been an essential part of Western culture, it's been able to do so because this basis proved to be so weak. So you see how deep he's going back in this genealogical account of reason's disease, its pathology. Once the primordial mimetic relationship between man and nature, still preserved in the sympathetic magic of the world of myth, once the mimetic relationship was replaced by a more rationalist one involving self-sacrifice and instrumental control, the road to the domination of nature and conformity to the status quo was already paved. Now, mimesis is a big concept uh, for the Frankfurt School. Benjamin Adorno developed as well. I'll come back to it in a moment. The point is that it has this kind of uh, let's say, original power which rationalism displaces. Uh, and modern civilization uh, is basically uh, only mimetic in a negative, problematic way. Rebelling against reason in the name of an injured nature was also insufficient. So one couldn't simply go back and somehow celebrate nature against domination. And this was shown, Horkheimer argued, by the Nazi example. Fascism, in fact, revealed itself, and I'm quoting as a satanic synthesis of reason and nature, the very opposite of that reconciliation of the two poles that philosophy had always dreamed of. So this is also a deeply pessimistic statement. Yes, reason and nature, so idealism and hope would come together. The Nazis did it, but in ways that ultimately were, of course, uh, extraordinarily hostile to anything emancipatory, anything that freedom had once dreamt of enabling. Now, Eclipse of Reason, for all of its lamenting of the withering way of objective reason, all its insistence on anamnestically preserving what had been lost, sought to resist the temptation of nostalgia. Horkheimer writes, 
the transition from objective to subjective reason was a necessary historical process, end quote. Attempts to return, we've seen it in neo-Thomism, attempts to return to earlier expressions of objective reason may well be, uh, well, intentioned, yes, sorry, that's true, but they run the risk of, quote, lagging behind the industrial and scientific developments of asserting meaning, asserting it, that proves to be just an illusion, and of creating reactionary ideologies. Just as subjective reason tends to vulgar materialism, so objective reason displays an inclination to romanticism. And the greatest philosophical attempt to construe objective reason, Hegel's, owes its incomparable force to its critical insight regarding this very danger, end quote. Rather than pitting one version of reason against another, one should work, quote, to foster a mutual critique, and thus, if possible, to prepare in the intellectual realm the reconciliation of the two in reality. So there's still a hope for some notion of reconciliation. And we'll see here, too, just to anticipate that Habermas gives up the hope for reconciliation. But at present, and these are the final words of the Eclipse of Reason, at present, denunciation of what is currently called reason is the greatest service reason can render. End quote. Now, in retrospect, it's clear that Eclipse of Reason, along with Dialect of Enlightenment, left critical theory with a genuine dilemma. Not only had the triumphalist historical narrative derived from Hegel and adopted by Marx proved wrong, but reactionary attempts to restore a metaphysical notion of reason that it existed before the fall into instrumentalization, subjectivism, and formalism, these two were also discredited. Well, at least Horkheimer claimed they were discredited, while himself still tacitly drawing on an emphatic ideal of reason that, if you look at it closely, was scarcely less metaphysical than those defended by, say, the Neo-Thomists. As a result, to quote one later commentator, his critique is burdened from the outset with an uncertainty regarding the validity of its standard. So it's as if he's falling back at something that he doesn't quite really believe in anymore, but nonetheless has no alternative to. There was also another, and I think equally problematic, issue. Horkheimer, as we've seen, had disparaged the functionalization of reason that he saw in Weber, and which could be traced even earlier to 19th century figures like Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche. For them, reason was little more than a tool, functional in the service of something else, a tool uh, that basically served, as Nietzsche in particular pointed out, power or the will or the hubris of the subject. While rejecting their sweeping claims, Horkheimer came, however, perilously close to the very same conclusion. From Schopenhauer in particular, he learned that a rational theodicy, such as that defended by Leibniz in terms of the principle of sufficient reason, or even Hegel in terms of the cunning of reason, a theodicy meant that suffering could be complacently turned into an affirmative function of a totalizing reason. The historical materialist in him, and also the Schopenhauerian pessimist who stressed the importance of pity and understood the reality of suffering, also balked at the idealist sublation of creaturely misery into a necessary and justifiable moment in this best of all possible worlds or in an historical narrative of redemption in which one could uh, somehow justify the evils of the past and even of the present in the service of a reason that would be ultimately achieved. Indeed, not only should reason in this strongly affirmative sense be prevented from justifying partial evil as part of a general good, which is, of course, what a theodicy does, but it also should be understood itself as complicit in causing the very suffering that it cannot redeem. Thus, when he argued, quote, that reason was born from man's urge to dominate nature, I already quoted that, Horkheimer was implying that the or function of reason, the genetic origin that had caused the disease from which it now suffered, was the preservation of the self and mastery of the natural world that ultimately led to the hegemony of subjective over objective reason in modernity. Rather than an act of anamnestic totalization, quote, the self-reflection of reason upon the conditions of its own possibility now means, as Shaila van Habib was, I think, correctly to put it, recovering the genealogy of reason, disclosing the subterranean history of the relationship between reason and self-preservation, reason and autonomy, and the domination of nature. And this is an interesting point. Uh, the anamnestic totalization Marcuse bought into this was the idea that we could somehow discover in the, re, uh, in the kind of remembering of what had been dismembered a totality which would ultimately be understood as rational. The genealogical approach, which Horkheimer and Adorno, and later Foucault, of course, uh, 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 applied, uh, 
meant that you looked at the origins of reason not in this kind of nostalgia for a moment of totality in the past, but rather to see where it had gone wrong, to see how it was in the service of power or domination. Many years later, Adorno would continue to express a similar point in his work Negative Dialectics, arguing, quote, that ratio is no more to be hypostatized in any other category. The transfer of the self-preserving interest from individuals to the species is spiritually coagulated with the form of the ratio, a form that is general and antagonistic at the same time, end quote. Because the universality inherent in reason from the very beginning produces an abstraction that dominates particulars, quote, all governing reason in installing itself above something else necessarily constricts itself. I mean, here the critique is made of concepts which dominate through subsumption, concepts which yoke together what is qualitatively distinct, making them somehow part of a general concept. And this is a uh, critique which is very, very hostile to a certain, let's say, impulse, maybe both in language and uh, in uh, <coughs> philosophy from the very beginning. Now, to resist that constriction, that paradoxically requires that the dialectic remain negative, renouncing the claim to totality that had allowed Hegel, in his more triumphalist moods, to reconcile what was, in fact, antagonistic, contradictory irreconcilable, in other words, a critique of theodicy. The antidote to the functionalization of reason was not functionalization of suffering by reason. Adorno, to be sure, never fully renounced uh, the critical reading of Hegel's notion of reason that animated earlier Frankfurt School texts like Marcuse's Reason Revolution. It's true, but he also sought to find in Hegel, he read him against the grain, a way beyond the potential domination in the universal rationality of self-reflective reconciliation. Here, that concept of mimesis, I mentioned earlier, which we've seen developed in the 1940s as a beleaguered redoubt, uh, a kind of enclave of benign nurturance outside the functionalization of reason as a tool of self-preservation. Here, mimesis was invoked as an alternative. And he sees it, interestingly, whether this is true, in, in Hegel. He writes, the speculative Hegelian concept rescues mimesis through spirit self-reflection. Truth is not adequatio. It's not the adequation of what's in the mind with what's out there. It's not that, but affinity, a term which involves not identity, not complete collapse, but a relationship, a meta relationship of affinity, a similitude, as Ben would have point, pointed out. And in the decline of, re, of idealism's, uh, uh, in the decline of idealism, reason's mindfulness of its mimetic nature is revealed by Hegel to be its human right. So this is a reading Hegel not as simply a conceptual philosopher, a pan-logist philosopher, but a philosopher who has a moment of mimesis in his own theory. Now, whether or not this rather generous reading of Hegel is persuasive, and I guess you can argue against it if you look at some of Hegel's texts, Adorno was pointing to one of the ways that after the eclipse of reason, critical theory did seek to locate a more viable alternative, one that might resist the full triumph of this withered, instrumental, formal, subjective rationality, however much it may have been latent in reason from the beginning. Now, before we try to spell out uh, the various alternatives, it's worth pausing with the implications of the eclipse metaphor itself. At its root is a loose historical narrative, a narrative in which at a certain point, the light of reason progressively illuminating the world, reason defined emphatically as an organon of uh, universal human freedom, a beacon of emancipatory enlightenment, uh, a moment when that light was occluded. Although some, of the, uh, some sort of historical rationalization did occur, a process that, of course, Max Weber in particular had masterfully described, it was a dimmer version of reason, subjective rather than objective, formal rather than substantive, concerned only with means rather than ends, instrumental. Why the shadow had fallen was not, however, explicitly spelled out. And you know, I mentioned earlier uh, some points in the argument, they said, well, it's there from the very beginning. At other points, it seems to be historical. They, they kind of fudge exactly what caused the eclipse? Was it the mathematicization of reason? Was it the triumph of the exchange principle? Was it capitalist reification? Was it the fetish of technology? Was it bureaucratization, positivist thought? You can go on and on. All were plausible candidates for the celestial body, we might say, that had passed before the rational sun. Would return to another of Horkheimer's metaphors. All, all of these were plausible pathogens for the disease of reason. But at times, we've also seen, Horkheimer seemed to assume the eclipse or degeneration was inevitable. He writes, the transition from objective to subjective reasoning, you recall, was not an accident. 
as the germs of reason self-liquidation, uh, these germs were present at the origin. Its disease, we might say, was thus almost a kind of form of autoimmunity. For all of its self-congratulatory leaving behind of the world of myth, rationality had revealed itself to be entangled with myth from the very beginning and still, alas, entangled at the end. Although lurking behind the larger narrative was the tacit acknowledgment of the failure of the working class to be the engine of an emancipation, a rational emancipation, we might say, that Marxist uh, theory had assumed it would be, it almost seemed as if reason would have self-destructed even uh, with a successful revolution. And one might argue in the 1940s they could still see the Soviet Union as uh, relatively successful. Why? For the domination of nature was by no means a goal that Marxism itself uh, had eschewed. It was thus hard to avoid the conclusion that the functionalization of reason as a tool in the primal struggle for self-preservation that had been lamented in Eclipse of Reason was not all that far removed from Michel Foucault's letter debunking of the Enlightenment project as a ruse of power rather than a project of emancipation. And Foucault himself very explicitly, when he read Dialect of Enlightenment, saw in it uh, his own argument, uh, recognized his affinity with Horkheimer and Adorno. Although both the astronomical and biological metaphors did hint at the possibility of a better future, I mean, eclipses, after all, pass, and one can recover from a disease, the first generation of the Frankfurt School, deeply traumatized by the lessons of the Holocaust. In other words, this is not something that comes out of nowhere. These are people who are looking at the history of Western uh, culture and seeing it culminating in Auschwitz, uh, were anything but optimistic in their reading of the Enlightenment's dialectic. Now, with such a bleak view of the prospects for a benign version of the rationalization of the world, it's no surprise that critical theory in its classical form, and I'm talking about the first generation here, uh, basically grew increasingly unable to generate a plausible materialist uh, and imminent point d'appui from which to launch its critique, uh, a foundation from which to make its critique. Reason was simply not able to do this. One possible resource was a reading of psychoanalytic theory, uh, reading it against the grain, which tried to rescue it from the pessimistic conclusions reached by Freud itself. Now, I have no time to go into their appropriation of Freud, but it's interesting that maybe in psychoanalysis they saw something that was a resource. Axel Honneth, who is maybe the most important third generation of the school, has written, and I quote, that psychoanalysis can be understood as positing the frankly anthropological thesis, so it's something that's not historical, that human subjects cannot be indifferent about the restriction of their rational capacities, so that we really have a kind of drive to be rational. Because their self-actualization, he goes on, is tied to the presuppositions of a cooperative <laughs> rational activity, they cannot avoid suffering psychologically under its deformation. This insight, he concludes, that there must be an internal connection between psychological intactness and undistorted rationality is perhaps the strongest impulse that Freud provides for critical theory." End quote. Now, of all the original members of the Frankfurt School, it was Herbert Marcuse who most doggedly maintained a faith in Hegelian dialectics and then infused it with the power of eros, which you remember Horkheimer, as we've seen, had fleetingly uh, invoked in Eclipse of Reason. And he was the one who gave Freud this kind of optimistic twist. Uh, the work that I'm sure many of you will recall, Eros and Civilization, written in 1955, tries to find some way to marry uh, Freud and uh, the Critical Theory Project. He writes, Eros redefines reason in its own terms. Reasonable is what sustains the order of gratification. Repressive reason gives way to a new rationality of gratification in which reason and happiness converge. A new rationality now of gratification not excluding happiness, not excluding the body, not excluding our desires, but somehow finding a way to realize them. Well, this is a book that was uh, maybe the most utopian that Marcuse was to write. Uh, I'm not sure it really, uh, in the long run, was very persuasive. Such a sunny redescription of Hegelian rationality, vitalized by libidinal energy, did not, I think, really suffice to provide a viable positive notion of reason after its eclipse. Although Freudian theory could still be mobilized for critical purposes, as Habermas was later to argue, especially in his work, Knowledge and Human Interests, it could not easily, I think, be combined with a Hegelian notion of reason, which extended beyond human pleasure to the historical world and its institutions. Celebrating the instincts 
as an archaic source of rebellious subjectivity, and Marcuse even tries to turn the death instinct around in a positive way, desire for nirvana, desire for the happiness that nirvana provides. Celebrating the instincts as an archaic source of rebellious subjectivity did not, I think, easily fit with the cultural work done by reason in dealing with the less laudable effects of unleashed desire. Uh, the death instinct does produce uh, aggression, does produce violence, does produce antagonism. So I think, in a way, I mean, I'm giving it rather short shrift, the Marcusean attempt to rescue reason by marrying it with a Freudian notion of eros, read against the grain, basically was not, it was a non-starter. Broadly speaking, the two most powerful alternatives, and I think these have still continued to uh, generate considerable uh, discussion, were developed by Adorno, largely in terms of aesthetic theory, and Habermas, who sought an alternative answer in communicative interaction. Both involved a reworking of the Enlightenment tradition, although with very different emphases. Now, there is by now a formidable literature uh, explicating and criticizing their arguments, but we have time to spell them out only concisely before hazarding a final judgment about the restoration of a viable concept of reason and critical theory after the eclipse. That'll be the task of the next two lectures. So let me basically work on Adorno now, and then we'll go on to Habermas uh, in subsequent uh, talks. Well, those will see, Habermas came to criticize Adorno's uh, solution. He could acknowledge that, at least in comparison to Horkheimer, quote, Adorno, faced with the aporia of the self-referential critique of reason, was better able to keep his composure because he could bring another motif into play. He did not need to depend solely upon the enlightening power of philosophical criticism, but could let his thinking circulate within the paradoxes of an identity logic that denies itself and yet illuminates from within. That is, for him, for Adorno, the genuine aesthetic experience of modern art had opened up an independent source of insight. So Habermas is saying, look, Adorno has at least this option, Horkheimer didn't fully develop, to turn to art. Now perhaps, in fact, the most succinct expression of Adorno's mature theory of the relationship between art and reason came in the parallel poemina to his posthumously published work, Aesthetic Theory. Here, Adorno repeated his warning against the potential of universal reason to overwhelm particulars. He writes, rationality would become rational only once it no longer repressed the individual in whose unfolding rationality has its right to exist. An emancipated individual would not, however, be in abstract opposition to the universal, but able somehow to embody it without his or her rationality, uh, individuality being extirpated. Now, Adorno did admit that art, too, cannot entirely escape the oppressive potential of reason. In themselves, he writes, artworks ineluctably pursue nature-dominating reason by virtue of their element of unity, which organizes the whole. So to create an artwork as an organic whole or as a unified totality or as a meaningful gestalt, there is an act like the domination of nature, which involves uh, yoking particulars together into something that's coherent, organized. But works of art also have a saving quality, which Adorno invoked as a model of rationality that might escape its dominating implications as a homogenizing concept. Reason in artworks, he explained, reason is reason as gesture. They synthesize like reason, yes, but not with concepts, not with propositions, not with syllogisms. Where these forms occur in art, they do so only as subordinated means. Rather, they do so by way of what transpires in the artworks. Their synthetic function is imminent. It is the unity of their self without immediate relation to anything externally given or determined in some way or another. It's directed to the dispersed, the uh, aconceptual, the quasi-fragmentary material with which in their interior space artworks are occupied." End quote. It is because of this, because the rationality of art, although it has a conceptual moment, is not reducible to that, it is because of this quote that art reminds us of an object, uh, objectivity freed from the categorical structure. This is the source of art's rationality, its character as knowledge, freed from the categorical, conceptual, overly, we might say, abstract structure of philosophy. However, rather than turning art into a sacred enclave of a normative notion of healthy rationality that somehow avoided the disease spelled out in the work he and Horkheimer had written in the 1940s, Adorno did acknowledge, quote, that artworks participate in the dialectic of enlightenment. 
windowless artworks participate in civilization. That which in artworks distinguishes themselves from the diffuse coincides with the achievements of reason qua reality principle. So art is not a perfect enclave of utopian, uh, let's say, imminence. It has its own complicity. It's never a space unto itself, never a full heterotopia. Uh, it has an echo uh, of what happens outside. Even the most seemingly disinterested, seemingly autonomous, seemingly organically uh, self-sufficient in modern artworks registers, if indirectly, what is beyond its apparent borders. There is, however, a subtle correction of the external reality principle in artwork. So you can see him tacking dialectically back and forth, which comes from a reversal of what has happened in the real world. The dialectical reversal, he writes, whereas the unity of artworks derives from the violence that reason does to things, so that's the kind of complicit side, this unity is at the same time the source of the reconciliation of the elements of artworks, a kind of benign reconciliation, one that isn't coerced, isn't extorted, isn't externally imposed. Art for Adorno combines mimesis, which you remember is something prior to uh, self-sacrificial rationality, combines mimesis with rationality, the latter having as one of its roles the opposing of empirical reality, so that old notion of reason being somehow critical of the empirical world. The rational shaping of artworks, he writes, effectively means their rigorous elaboration in themselves. And as a result, they come into contrast with the world of the nature-dominating ratio, in which aesthetic ratio originates and become a work for themselves." End quote. The rational moment in works of art, we might say, follows from the need to give mimetic comportment, mimetic behavior, an objective embodiment. The relationship is more uh, of a kind of constellation of juxtaposed elements, and here the influence of Walter Benjamin who was particularly keen on Adorno, more a juxtaposition, a constellation, than a full Hegelian sublation, Aufhebung, uh, for which Marcuse, remember, seems to have still had uh, yearnings. Need for Adorno, art transcends not only nature-dominating ratio, but aesthetic ratio as well, expressing something that he frankly calls irrational, that being the demand for happiness. So Adorno is trying to give us a very complicated notion of works of art partaking in, uh, let's say, a nefarious version of rationality, having a certain kind of rationality which he sees potentially benign, but also having within them a moment which he frankly calls in aesthetic theory irrational, and that is the demand for happiness. And Marcuse also talks about happiness, but this is now in some complicated, not fully sublated. As he puts it, one of the most important sentences in aesthetic theory, and I quote, if the talus of reason is a fulfillment that is in itself necessarily not rational, happiness is the enemy of rationality and purpose of which it nevertheless stands in need, art makes this irrational telos its own concern. So art is somehow capacious enough not to abject desire, not to abject the body, not to abject happiness. That is, however necessary reason in its most benign form might be, it's never sufficient. Even when liberated from its identification with instrumentalization, with formalization, with subjectivization, reason cannot alone be the standard of utopian redemption. So you see Adorno in a way uh, it's a kind of reclusé uh, pour mieux sauter. He's kind of uh, basically limiting reason because he wants to say, yes, there's something outside it, happiness, desire, even the irrational, which has a quality that needs to be included in any notion of emancipation or even, to use a religious term, he sometimes favored redemption. Even when it no longer functions to serve self-preservation in the exchange principle or is disentangled from its bureaucratic institutionalization, Reason needs to make room for something else, to atone for its original sins of dominating nature and universalizing particularity. In short, even a revived substantive notion of reason would have to concede that the ultimate values it affirms may come from elsewhere. Art, for all of its service as a placeholder of a possible future utopia, does not really function as a model of that benign rationalization of the world envisioned by Hegelian dialectics. So art precisely is not to be subsumed under philosophy. Uh, the mimetic motion, a um, uh, moment in art, not to be subsumed under conceptual. A negative dialectics, and that's why this is negative, not positive, a negative dialectics knows, among other things, the limits of reason even in its most benevolent form, and as such, it reveals itself as indebted in a way more to Kant, who also denied the ability of reason to account for individual happiness, than Hegel, for whom all of its limits were to be overcome. 
Now, despite these formula formulations, Adorno's position should not be construed, and this is a kind of delicate point, as a straightforward opposition between reason and its irrational other, whether that be understood as uh, happiness or as bodily pleasure or as material reality or as imagination, emotion, the id, the violence, mimesis, madness, whatever. Uh, one has to avoid that. Rather than abandoning the sensory rump as inherently outside of reason narrowly construed and thus an external threat to be dominated, art for Adorno overcomes without fully collapsing the distinction. So once again, a constellation rather than a full reconciliation. It finds a way to bring together universal and particular spirit, matter, form, and substance while, however, resisting the full autonomy of the creative or dominating subject. So this is not done as it is in Hegel on the basis of an expressive subject objectifying itself, remembering what it objectified through an act of animistic totalization, seeing rationality in the process, uh, but basically doing it from the point of view of that meta-subject. Both a memory of a time before the separation and a foretaste of what might be a future reconciliation, art is not the betrayer of reason, but rather its salvation. A revived emphatic concept of reason, now capacious rather than self-limiting, thus has, we might say, a discursive moment, conceptual moment, and a non-discursive moment, which allows it to avoid the domination of one by the other, uh, which mars subjective instrumental formal rationality. Art becomes a figure for uh, both what metaphysics cannot contain and master, and for the transcendent intention of a metaphysics that refuses positivism and challenges the status quo. Thus, Adorno's delicately formulated declaration at the very end of negative dialectics of a kind of solidarity with metaphysics at the time of its fall. So yes, you can't get back to metaphysics. Remember, we've seen Horkheimer attack uh, Neotomism, Aristotelianism, you can't go back. And yet there's a solidarity with that moment in metaphysics which seeks to uh, transcend the status quo and which has, even in the work of art, a place. It's not the dominating place. Art can't be reduced to concepts, metaphysics, philosophy, but art is also in need of philosophy to supplement it. An even more generous interpretation of Adorno's delicate balance between reason and mimesis, reason and its other, achieved by art, is suggested once again by Axel Honneth, who argues that the latter was necessary, mimesis was necessary, in the origin of the former. That, in other words, self-preservation was not the sole motivation behind the genesis of rational behavior. So this is, uh, in a way, reading uh, Adorno against Horkheimer. He writes, only through imitative behavior, which for Adorno originally goes back to an affect of loving care, do we achieve a capacity for reason because we learn by gradually envisioning, envisioning others' intentions uh, to relate to their perspectives on the world. Now, this is a reading uh, of uh, Adorno, and we've seen this reading of Freud, which comports nicely with Axel Honneth's own work on recognition, which goes in very interesting new directions, but it's a way to sort of see continuity with Adorno. For Honneth, there is no inherent conflict between rationality and mimesis, despite Adorno's having called the happiness derived from the latter irrational. Adorno, he writes, quote, sees our special imitation-based capacity for reason precisely in experiencing the adaptive goals of speechless beings, even things, uh, as intentions demanding rational consideration. Sees our imitation-based capacity in experiencing the adaptive goals of speechless beings prior to our entry into language, uh, the infant, uh, the neonate even, uh, doing the imitating of the mother. Even things somehow having intentions demanding rational consideration. He's therefore convinced, Honet writes of Adorno, that any true knowledge has to retain the original impulse of loving imitation, mimesis, sublimated within itself in order to do justice to the rational structure of the world for our uh, perspective." End quote. Now, such an expansion of the scope of reason to encompass what is often abjected as its other is not only an antidote to identifying reason just with the domination by the concept of the particular, but also, and this is turning it against the other front, we might say, an alternative to the simplistic reversal of the hierarchy between reason and its alleged other. It avoids the privileging of what in Kantian epistemological terms would be called intuition over concept, preferring a dialectical mediation of the two. It knows that reversing the prevailing hierarchy can produce a simplistic celebration of whatever other is posited. And I've mentioned a number of the before, faith, emotions, the body, art, the senses, ecstasy, violence, madness. The list is really endless. 
Uh, it understands that uh, believing that the other reason is somehow a reservoir or reserve of the vital energy and normative value that's constrained by reason is not sufficient. At various times in the modern era, thinkers like Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Derrida, Foucault have all been accused, maybe rightly or wrongly, of endorsing this very reversal of celebrating the other reason, which is merely the abstract negation of dominating instrumental rationality. Adorno's defensive art, we have to understand, and this is one of my concluding arguments tonight, was designed to avoid this sterile outcome, this simplistic reversal, ensuring that for all the depredations carried out in the name of enlightenment, in the name of reason, there was a sliver of hope to escape its dominating implications. One final reason for refusing to abandon that hope was the role that art also played in protesting against suffering, both human and natural which was the complement of us prefiguring a happiness to come. So yes, it has this utopian prefiguration, but also art contains uh, a memory of past suffering and suffering that it does not, as you recall, Horkheimer also warned against, uh, is not justified as a theodicy. Horkheimer always resisted a theodicy, something that would redeem past suffering, preferring Schopenhauer's pessimism to Hegel's too easy optimism about the alleged cunning of reason. Past suffering could not be made into an instrument of future happiness. Adorno likewise avoided any hint of a sublation of misery in a narrative of redemption. But he also acknowledged that suffering, or better put, the surplus suffering that extended beyond the mortality and vulnerability of the human condition, was itself not a permanent quality of all societies. The future, well, it just might be different. And although reason in some of its guises may have abetted that suffering, it was also a necessary weapon in the struggle to create an alternative future. Aesthetic rationality, in its broad sense, and I haven't done justice to all of its complexity in a work like aesthetic theory, aesthetic rationality was thus a prefigurative placeholder for that possible outcome, one of those bottles thrown into the sea that he hoped would be uh, washed up and read in the future. But, and this is my concluding thought, but we have to, I think, wonder was it really a compelling and sufficient placeholder for that emphatic notion of objective rationality in which the early Frankfurt School had placed its hopes before the eclipse? Did it perhaps cede a little too much ground to the diseased version of reason, instrumental, formless, subjective, the critical theory it feared was now almost totally hegemonic in the modern world? And as a consequence, did it in fact really retreat into a beleaguered aesthetic sanctuary, a kind of enclave, a little to natural preserve, we might say, uh, that had, in fact, very little chance of ever expanding its territory, prefiguring, but how? Prefiguring through what means? Did it really uh, identify concrete institutional embodiments outside that little enclave that would allow a reading of history as suggesting a more benign rationalization that might challenge that rather sour one decried in dialect of enlightenment? Did it still fall back too much on a discredited metaphysical notion of substantive reason, which could no longer be effectively recalled uh, in an act of desperate solidarity after its fall? I mean, maybe Adorno thought you could hold on, but maybe it was wise to just let it go. Was it more intuitively invoked than justified argumentatively? Was mimesis, as Sheila Ben Habib has put it, too fuzzy a concept to provide a real alternative to relations of domination? Did aesthetic rationality depend too much on the model of the modern artwork? It's another interesting issue. Art, capital A or capital K for Kunst, but which artworks? Uh, modern artworks were Adorno's favorite, but they themselves were historical. They were in danger of passing into history. He understood that himself as the bourgeois subject, which had been uh, the precondition of modern art. Did it fully escape aesthetic rationality? Did it fully escape the aporias of a subject-centered philosophy which tacitly posited a notion of reason as a transcendental faculty in a world in which competing communities of historically variable subjects resisted being subsumed under a single universal model. It was did aesthetic rationality take seriously uh, the plurality of different contexts, the type of thing that has always been argued against Enlightenment universalization ever since maybe Herda. Well, all right, let me leave you with these questions. For these were among the very questions that impelled the Frankfurt School's most gifted second-generation theorist, Jürgen Habermas, to seek a radically new foundation for reason itself, hoping to salvage the critical energies of the Enlightenment tradition broadly understood. And it is to uh, his very different solution 
that we will turn in the next lecture on Jürgen Habermas's response to the eclipse of reason. Thanks very much. Um, we have a dialectical tension. The dialectical tension is one between substantive reason and the desire for happiness which may come under a categor category of gastronomy. So, we will have a short question and answer period. I think that Marty is very happy to take questions, but if the chair is seemingly authoritarian, then he departs from both Adorno and Horkheimer. So, uh, the floor is open. I know that this was, as usual, an exceedingly rich, highly textured, dense, but worthwhile lecture, which obviously needs to be read and not just heard to ingest all its depth. However, the floor is open. Don't let your desire for happiness overcome your substantive reason. Give them a minute. Christoph. Louder, louder. Well, there's a mic coming. Uh, maybe just for clarification, in order to uh, make. Okay. Uh, it's a question of clarification, and just to get the discussion uh, on. <coughs> um, you talked about Adorno and the, the uh, very fundamental meaning of the aesthetic. Um, I would just wonder and like to ask you. What about the natural beauty? It, se it seemed to me that you were totally focusing on the aesthetic within the work of art. And I think it has a very important place in that. So just for clarification. Uh, Adorno takes very seriously the model of natural beauty as uh, important for humanly created art as well. So he sees natural beauty as, um, in a way, an antidote to the overly anthropocentric version of the aesthetic, which is the production of human will or human imagination or human subjective um, uh, craftsmanship or whatever. Uh, why he does this is simply because the natural world uh, represents the predominance of the object uh, over the subject. Uh, we look at the natural world, marvel at the beauty of a sunset or a mountain range, uh, and we have not created it. We have not, uh, in a way, imagined it out of our own uh, genius. We are not the sole source of it, whether it's God or nature or something external to us. This beauty is somehow a reminder uh, of our own, uh, let's say, insufficiency. So to that extent, natural beauty is a placeholder of the uh, otherness, we might say, outside of human rationality imposed on the world which we nonetheless can judge, can see as beautiful, can describe, can talk about, can include in our, uh, let's say, understanding of what constitutes such categories as the beautiful or the sublime for that matter. Uh, and therefore, it stimulates us. It has the quality to uh, engage us in a dialogue with the natural world. It even has, if Benjamin is right, uh, its own uh, language, its own intentions. Uh, and there's a bit of anthropomorphizing of the natural world in Benjamin. He wants to make the mute uh, natural world speak and so forth, which may be a little problematic in our modern scientific age. But be that as it may, it, it functions as a way to uh, make us aware of the humility of the human species. So reason, in this sense, is a reason which knows its limits, which knows that it is not absolutely an imposition onto the world, nor is it really found in the world as if there were intelligible forms. So nature, I mean, nature is itself an immensely uh, rich and extremely um, self, uh, let's say, contested concept. I mean, I think uh, Arthur Lovejoy, when he once looked uh, in a famous essay on the uses of nature and the Enlightenment, came up with something like 56 different definitions. I, mean, I may be getting the number wrong, but you know, you get the point. So the natural, what we mean by nature itself, is culturally formed. But to the extent that it alerts us to the fact that we are both part of nature and yet also not fully, uh, in some sense, uh, naturally determined, uh, but nonetheless 
you know, not above, we're not angels, we're not gods. It, it creates a kind of understanding of the need to include in an expanded notion of a hu humble reason that natural other. And so art has, because of the model of natural beauty, also an awareness of this limit, uh, that art is not fully the expression of the genius, not fully the expression of the imagination of the dominating subject. And that's the, uh, the value of accepting that version of nature. Now, it gets complicated because of their understanding of the fascist evocation of the natural, you know, which of course turns it in a very sinister direction and combines it with instrumental rationality. So uh, here, once again, the definition of nature has to be understood. Uh, obviously, biological racism was a kind of pseudo-naturalism and so forth. Uh, Habermas also, in interesting ways, tries to deal with nature. He talks about a weak naturalism. Uh, so these are, these are still, uh, you know, I would say open questions, how we um, create a consolation between the human and the natural, the subjective, the objective, the dominating subject and the object that resists domination. All that is still very much in play, but art is one of the sites, we might say, of that, con uh, of that contestation. Other comments, questions? Ah, you're on, sorry. Uh, it will be nice to talk a little bit about the disease of the Frankfurt School, um, uh, which was caused, among other things, by exiling, uh, exi the ex exiling the political imagination to the fields of art and religion, and um, ignoring the marginal fabric of politics, which actually was one of the f reasons for the power of fascism. And one would have expected the Frankfurt School thinkers to infer something from this. Uh, the one thing that puzzled me even more than anything else is that um, there was no, to the best of my understanding, uh, uh, there was so much fear of dealing with emotion as the part of the irrational. that There was no serious consideration of the emotional conditions of the force of rationality in human behavior. After all, rationality assumes a very complex uh, system of emotional elements. That was not dealt with to the best of my knowledge, and I think that was part of the general um, categorization of, of, uh, of uh, perhaps from the point of view of political theory of politics, generally it was a major lacuna, uh, uh, not only in, uh, in the Frankfurt School, but also in liberal ideology altogether. So that in some sense what we are seeing here is that uh, the, the Frankfurt School discussion that you describe so brilliantly with so many nuances is a very close family discussion among so a group of philosophers which miss some of the main elements of what politics is all about. Well, I, I, I share the sense that there was what is often called a political deficit. Sometimes people talk about a sociological deficit. Honet does, for example, in his book on uh, the critique of power, which deals with uh, basically Foucault and Habermas. Uh, but many people have argued there was a political deficit. Now, this is a long story. Initially, as Marxists, they hoped for the unity of theory and practice. Some of them were involved in politics in the 1920s. They certainly were enthusiastic about the revolutions at the beginning. But they became progressively disillusioned in Weimar and uh, in the United States, whereas exiles, they played no direct role. They weren't citizens for a long time. They weren't able to speak English. They were basically outside the political fray. And even though they probably had, as many emigres uh, did, a positive attitude towards Roosevelt, uh, they were not, I think, uh, comfortable talking about politics until the 1960s, when, of course, Marcuse became involved with the New Left. But that was much later. Now, what would the politics have looked like? And it's quite clear that they had a very, let's say, utopian notion of a politics that would be system transforming. So it could not be a politics to work within the system. Uh, they did not like reformist politics. Luxembourg was maybe their last champion in some way. And she you know, dies uh, early on in Weimar, and Luxembourg's politics loses out to Leninist politics. In most cases, they kept their distance from Leninism. You know, there are some moments when Marcuse got a little bit closer than one would like, but the rest of them were not Leninists. So there really was no direct politics during this period. Now, when they got back to, Weimar, uh, to Germany after the war, they were, uh, in some ways, 
supporters of the um, restoration of a German democracy, or maybe the creation for the first time, of a German democracy that would not be uh, authoritarian. They were very anxious to avoid that. Uh, and yet would perhaps have some elements that would be still proto-utopian. But when the 60s emerged and the students demanded that they be really utopian and really radical, they said, no, we have too much to lose. That we've achieved something in the uh, Bundesrepublik. You don't throw it away, that the rule of law, the rule of you know, relative liberal democracy, whatever you want to call it, was going on in the politics of that period, worth holding on to. So they, at that point, became defenders and were involved in the public realm. I mean, you, know, you look at Adorno's work, he has radio shows and they write in the newspapers. They're not, they're not arbitrary intellectuals. But the political deficit is real. They don't really come up with a strong institutional sense of what politics might look like. Uh, and uh, whether or not they understood it as irrational or not, they really didn't uh, give us much. I mean, maybe Kirchheim and Neumann, some figures at the Institute. Uh, it was not until Habermas that this uh, is rectified. And we'll talk, I think, next time about Habermas and a certain version of rationality, which does, I think, nicely uh, comport with uh, the ideals of uh, a politics that maybe Hannah Arendt and others would have supported. Now, as for the irrational moment, I mean, they certainly were among the Marxists. I mean, there are a few others, Henrik de Man, uh, in a certain respect, who took seriously Freud and took seriously the emotional moment, Wilhelm Reich. There are others who, who were also involved. Bloch, in a way, I mean, although Bloch was not very pro-Freudian. I mean, Bloch had a, a lot of hostility to Freud. But certainly, certainly the moment of emotion, the moment of the irrational, irrational, whatever. They took it seriously, usually seeing it as nefarious, as Freud himself had done. You know, I mean, when Freud looked at uh, the ways in which uh, libidinal effects has occurred around leaders and so forth, I mean, Freud was very pessimistic about modern democracy. And they shared a certain uh, amount of elitist pessimism about that. They also understood, and Marcuse in particular, that Eros was on the side of democracy. Now, how it was on the side, you know, we'd have to figure out. But, but they, did, they did at least argue that. They at least did argue that. Uh, the Thanatos, broadly speaking, was on the side of something else, authoritarianism, whatever. Um, but I would say that they were more attuned than most other Marxists who uh, had more instrumental notions, more strategic notions, and who did sometimes rather cynically try to whip up mass uh, you know, support in the same way the fascists did. I mean, this is one of the things that if you accept totalitarian analysis, um, they shared. Uh, I mean, liberals do it as well in different ways, but uh, th they were more, I would say, aware of the dangers in a politics that was too emotional uh, than hopeful of the ways in which it could, be, it could be mobilized for good purposes. Okay, we have time for one more comment. Michael Head. Yes. No, no, I didn't see. An topic, uh, uh, and I don't want to create the impression that there's an alliance here of three people <laughs> sitting next to each other. But um, uh, uh, from an early modern perspective, if I may, um, I wonder to what extent uh, the uh, first generation of the Frankfurt School was aware and to what extent how explicit they were about the <coughs> national differences of understanding reason. That is, when they go against uh, instrumental reason, the distinction between object and sub subject and object and so, uh, and so on and so forth. You mentioned, of course, the critique of Descartes, but uh, beyond that, uh, um, uh, the type of instrumental rationalism they were coming against was basically French and English, right. where they relied, if I understand correctly, mostly on a, uh, on a German tradition. So the, the uh, national differences from someone who was coming from the 17th, early 18th century's perspective is, is, is very marked, is very uh, significant. And this may be tied into uh, uh, Yaron's question, uh, writing in the, during the period of the Second World War is especially significant. That is, they are coming out against uh, concepts of reason which were uh, the hallmark and the, the uh, foundation of the uh, political systems and political uh, ideology of the, of the Allies against fascism and against Nazism. So I, I yeah, wonder whether that was excellent point. Uh, in I mean, I would add the Americans as well as the British and French. In other words, they're, yeah. they're, when they come to the United States, they are struck by the importance of pragmatism or a version of positivism. They get it. Uh, they simplify it. I mean, uh, after um, many years, uh, Habermas in particular came to understand that Peirce and 
uh, Dewey and uh, you know other pragmatists, Mead had uh, much to teach us. So the, he did not have a caricatured version. But the early Frankfurt School, when they came to the United States, had a very negative version of uh, pragmatism. They didn't agree with Stanley Ho uh, with Sidney Hook that it could be made compatible with Marxism. Now they basically were schooled in the German idealist version of reason, Hegel, and to some extent Kant, and other. Uh, you know, let's say, versions of a kind of strong speculative notion of rationality, which resisted the instrumentalization of it or the individualization that begins maybe with Hobbes or with other figures in the early modern period who then could be understood as part of the utilitarian or liberal traditions which they disliked uh, in uh, the United States, in Britain, and France. They spent some time talking about national differences, but by and large, uh, and this is one of the things that made Dialectic Enlightenment uh, both in some ways uh, a very remarkable book, but also a limited book, they talked about the West. They talked about the whole tradition, we might say, uh, going back even as far as, I don't know what, Odysseus, monotheism, something that really is uh, proto-national. It's not uh, yet divisible. And so as a result, Dalek Enlightenment is a book which talks about the Enlightenment, not as the French Enlightenment or the Scottish Enlightenment, or whatever, but as something that goes all the way back as part of you know, the Western domination of nature. It's sometimes been argued that the uh, force of this book in Germany after the war, Albert Wellmer makes this point, was because it gave the Germans not quite an alibi, but at least situated them in the larger dialectic, which they themselves as a nation, as a culture, were not responsible for. That they were just simply the, you know, maybe the worst version of it, but it was something that was shared elsewhere. Now, this is, you know, it's not absolutely crazy. The Germans are not absolutely separate from, and we know the fascists in Italy, we know the French Vichy government, you know. I mean, the, the Germans did some pretty awful things, God knows, but these other countries from a different tradition were capable of doing things just as awful. And if they'd had an opportunity, you know. So th they were right to make some sort of, let's say, post-national or international or cosmopolitan critique. But this did lead them occasionally to go too far in the opposite direction, not give us as strong a uh, nationally oriented analysis. And I remember when I was in Montagnola, where uh, Horkheimer and Pollock were in retirement in 1969, I think, uh, they showed me a collection of materials they had gathered on the question of nationalism. And they were going to write about nationalism. Now, they never actually got around to it. But they saw that. And Marxists in general had a lot of trouble dealing with nationalism. It was, it was not, I mean, national liberation struggles, that was one thing. But basically, nationalism was kind of a missing link in their analysis of modernity. And ever since, you know, 1914 and the uh, collapse of the international proletariat, the question of nationalism has, in a way, uh, haunted the left. You know, how does one deal with uh, nationalism? Is it something that's healthy or something that can be construed as emancipatory, or is it always reactionary? And, always, and they, they didn't, I think, give us much help with that, frankly. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I would say you're, you're right in saying this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, well, just two comments. Uh, we've done away with psychoanalysis. We've dealt with aestheticism. We're going to hear Habermas's answer on Tuesday night. I sincerely hope uh, that, that you will uh, attend. Uh, I'm sure that having heard Habermas's alternative, Marty will also say some critical things about Habermas. So you are cordially invited to that. I just have one other comment. Um, it's not only nationalism that they didn't examine, but looking from the perspective of this country, their belief that one couldn't go back to some religious conception may also have been misconceived. I will see you, I hope, on Tuesday night. Thank you for a wonderful experience. <laughs>